Welcome back to Little Z Farm. I'm Katie. Thanks for joining me today as we go through part two of a series on raising chickens for eggs. If you missed the first part, it was the top 10 chicken myths debunked. And I hope that after you watched that, you were feeling inspired to start your own flock or minimally realized, hey, raising chickens isn't that bad. And some of those things that I thought about eggs and chicks and chickens, they just aren't true. If you missed that video, I'll link it below. Um, just check it out when you get a chance. It has some good information and uh, kind of leads into this part of the series as we start talking about actually starting your flock. When we were ready to start raising our chickens, uh, we had a lot of questions, just like we do with most things. Like, where do I get a chicken? We didn't know if we should start with grown hens that were already laying, if we should get baby chicks or juvenile chickens. We didn't know how to tell if a chicken was a girl or a boy, or what the terminology was, and we really just didn't know where to get started. And so that's what this part of the series is about. Um, I'm gonna answer all those questions, and I'm also gonna give you a little bit of insight into our favorite breeds and why we raise specific breeds here. You can hear our chicks in the background probably for the duration of this video. Sorry, not sorry for the sounds. So you've decided that you want chickens for eggs, but what breeds are gonna be best for your family? Don't worry, I got you. At Lil Z Farm, we've raised almost a dozen different breeds of chickens over the past five years. That's quite a few. And we've learned a lot during that time. Some are more prolific layers than others. Some are better in harsher winters. Some are known for their docile nature. Some are a little bit flightier and a little less friendly. I'll take this moment to remind you we've never had a mean chicken. Bantam breeds are much smaller and produce smaller eggs, but sometimes they're better for smaller spaces. There's a lot of different things about chickens that some are just breed related, but some you just kind of learn as you go. But all of it can kind of leave your head spinning. I'm gonna tell you where we started. We went to our local feed store, we read the descriptions on the side of the brooder boxes, and just kind of selected our chickens from there. Okay. Maybe not the best way to start when we had no idea what we were getting into. And actually those first three breeds of chickens that we got have ended up being our favorite over the years. All three breeds were prolific layers. We got great quality eggs. Um, they were friendly and fun to be around and pretty gentle with just people in general. And they could survive our harsh Missouri winters and our harsh Missouri summers. We do the whole 110 degrees to negative 20 degrees here. So we kind of had to have chickens that would fit that whole scope of weather. That day we came home with six Plymouth Bard Rocks, six Rhode Island Reds, and three Buff Orpingtons. I try not to pick favorites here, but I'm gonna tell you my favorite here in a minute. So this trio of kind of regular standard size laying hens are the three breeds that I would recommend to anyone starting a new flock. All the chickens in your flock don't have to be the same breed. And having these three to start was really the best introduction for us into raising these chickens for eggs. And your chickens are not only gonna be great egg producers for your family, but they're also going to provide great compost material for your garden. And they're also just gonna be funny little friends that you enjoy being around. I'm not gonna be able to go into detail on all chicken breeds that are out there. There's a lot. <laughs> but I am going to go into just a little bit more detail on those three breeds and a few other breeds that are easy to come by here in the United States. Good chicken. So the birds I'm gonna talk about here are your standard size, um, laying hens and um, standard can mean different things but when I say standard I'm referring to size. There are standard size and then there are smaller breeds or bantams or banties um, and no, that's a much smaller breed. Your standard size hens are going to be anywhere from like four to 12 pounds. It can get, they can get pretty big and we actually just got some Jersey Giants and those hens could get up to 15 pounds. Standard size hens are gonna lay those standard size eggs, somewhere between the medium and extra large or grande size, as you sometimes see on the box in the store. Your bantams are gonna be anywhere from one to three pounds. That's significantly smaller, so like one third the size of a standard size chickens. And their eggs are gonna be smaller too, half the size or even less. I'll talk briefly about the Bantams a little bit later, but I don't have a lot of experience with them myself. 
I do know that the Bantams, those breeds can sometimes be good for people who are starting with a backyard flock. So we'll touch on that in a little bit. Over the years, we've had many different standard sized types of chickens. And the one that we've had the most of are Rhode Island Reds. And you might recognize that breed name even if you've never thought about raising a chicken. It's kind of the most well-known um, breed of chicken. And they're a dual purpose bird, which means they're raised for both meat and egg producing. But the Rhode Island Reds can lay up to like 260 eggs a year. Remember, chickens don't lay an egg every day. And 260, that's a good number. That is a high producing chicken when it comes to eggs. It means that over the course of 365 days a year, your Rhode Island Red is gonna lay around 250, 260 eggs during that time. They're also a docile breed, but they're not as docile as my favorite breed of chicken. I told you I'd tell you. Buff Orpingtons. Buff Orpingtons have hens that weigh up to about eight pounds. They're this beautiful, light yellow, fluffy bird that just commands the room. And by room, I mean farm. And by command, I just mean my attention is drawn to them personally. They're also great egg layers. They produce 200 to 280 eggs per year. So you're getting a lot of bang for your buck with these types of chickens. They're definitely the most friendly breed that we've personally had here on our farm. And actually, Little Z Farm is named after our first Buff Corbington, named Little Z. Our uncle actually named her, and I loved that chicken. She really marched to the beat of her own drummer, and uh, she loved food. She was a Zorns. Buff Orpingtons might just be my personal preference, but I know that many people agree that they are a great addition to your flock, especially a starter flock, and I think that you'll love them too. The third breed that we had gotten in our first batch, I don't like to say batch, the third breed that we got in our flock were the Plymouth Bard Rocks. And this is another beautiful bird that's kind of marked by the black and white stripes. Also prolific layers, laying up to 260 eggs per year. They do tend to be a little bit broodier. And I'll tell you what broody means. Broody just means that they have a tendency to want to lay on their eggs and hatch them. And this isn't gonna be a problem for you if you're gathering your eggs every day. It's just something to kind of be aware of. Also, if you're thinking about hatching eggs in the future, a Plymouth Bard Rock might be a good solution for you. And the Plymouth Bard Rocks are the best at laying through cold winters. So those were the three that we started out with, and I love them. It's hard not to love a chicken. Some other popular high producing egg layers include Americanas, which always are come in a variety of colors, and they lay these really pretty light green, blue, brown eggs. Um, if you're looking for variety in your eggs, they're definitely my favorite for that reason. Also, white leghorns and golden lace wine dots are also great breeds um, if you're looking for a high producing chicken to add to your flock. All these breeds are easy to find too, which is important when you don't exactly know where to get them. And all the breeds that I just mentioned are cold hardy, which means that they do just fine in cold weather. If you're set on a smaller breed of chicken or a bantam, then the Easter Egger Bantams are probably your best bet for getting more eggs. And you have to keep in mind that Bantams in general lay fewer eggs than your standard sized breeds. Also, Bantams lay smaller eggs. So they're gonna be half the size or one third the size of a normal standard chicken egg. And we would actually love to get some Bantams eventually here at Little Z Farm. We don't have them. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to integrate Bantams and standard sized chickens together because the standard sized chickens might beat up on the Bantams. And so I think when we bring Bantams to our farm eventually, we will have a separate coop and a run for them. The other thing that we face here is predators. And since Bantams are so much smaller, I think they're gonna be a lot more susceptible to kind of more generic predators, like raccoons, possums, things like that might give a bantam a run for their money, whereas our bigger chickens fare a little bit better with those. This might not be a worry for you though, especially if you're raising backyard chickens or if you have a permanent large run that your bantams can be in, it might not be a worry for you at all. And I would love to get the silky bantams. They're so funny looking and they're also supposed to be like the top docile breed of all chickens, which makes me think they would be good furry little friends. So I guess 
my two recommendations on Bantams, just based on my own research and knowing people who have had them, would be the Silky Chicken, just for their looks, not to be vain. Easter Egger Layer Chicken, Bantam sized. Their eggs are also different colors, and so it would be fun to kind of have that combination. So there's many different things you can consider when selecting what laying hens that you want for your flock and your rooster. You know, if you choose chickens with a docile nature, the roosters are less likely to be aggressive or as protective, which really you need to weigh that. Do you need a more protective rooster, depending on how you're raising your chickens, or do you not really care about that? Do you even need a rooster at all? Remember, you don't for eggs. But at the end of the day, if you stick to those kind of original breeds that I mentioned, I think that you're gonna be just fine and be really happy with the egg production and just the general demeanor of your chickens. So once you pick out what kind of chickens you want, where do you get them? Should I get adult chickens? Should I get a rooster? Should I raise baby chicks? Listen, you can do whatever you want. And that's the kind of beauty of a lot of different things about homesteading or having a farm or just having backyard chickens. You can choose what works best for you. But I'm gonna go ahead and give you my opinion on what works best for us, and you can take it and use it how you want to. Get the baby chicks. So you can get an adult chicken online. Think Craigslist or Facebook or somewhere like that. You can also find them. Hatcheries will sell adult chickens, um, and you can get them from there. And Adult chickens have their benefits. When you buy an adult chicken, if they're over five months old, they're either laying or close to laying. So if you need egg production like now, really that's your only option. But since most of us are here to kind of learn how to raise a happy and productive flock, I think it's important that I mention that raising baby chicks for us has been super beneficial for a lot of reasons. Beyond that chicks are adorable. Since our chickens have always been around us since they were babies, they're very used to us. They know that basically we're their caregiver. They know that food comes from us and they know that we're kind of in charge. And I'm wondering if that's why we've never had a problem with roosters or mean chickens or anything like that because we've acclimated them from the very beginning. Also, it's hard to introduce adult chickens to other adult chickens. So if you're mixing from multiple different places, adult chickens, that can get tricky. And chickens will beat each other up. And roosters will fight to the death if you don't do things properly. Raising chicks and raising them up, and then as you add to your flock, slowly introducing new chicks as young chickens into your flock has just been really good for us. And we never had a problem. So the downside to raising chicks is you have to have appropriate and safe housing for them in the beginning, which may look different than your permanent coop housing. So it takes five to six months for a chicken to grow to lay an egg. So you do have that wait time. That passes really fast as you're enjoying the baby chicks growing into their adult form. So you have four choices if you're going to go the baby chick route. You can find a local hatchery and visit them which is a really cool idea because you can learn from them as you pick out the chicks that you want. We've never had the opportunity to do that, but I am looking forward to doing that in the future. You can find them online from local breeders, but it's important if you do that, that you know that they're coming from a healthy environment um, and why they're being sold. You don't wanna get home with sick birds. You can also get chicks from your local feed store and usually feed stores or farm stores will have chick days in the spring and sometimes the fall. Um, they didn't have it this year and I'm not sure on that, but usually there are spring days and fall days for baby chicks. The other option is you can order them online from a hatchery and those get mailed. Before you freak out on me about chickens traveling through the US Postal Service, listen to this. Did you know that a baby chick can survive on the yolk that it came from for up to three days? And in the natural world, when a mama hen hatches her baby chickens, sometimes they're not coming out from under her for a day or two because she has to wait for all the chickens to hatch. And they're absorbing all of the nutrients from that yolk into their body and that is how they're getting what they need to survive. That's just natural. Baby chicks will not eat or drink until the second day of their life, and for that reason, we've found it completely humane 
to order chicks online and have them arrive within a 48 hour period. As always though, you do you. The good news about the breeds I mentioned is that they're often locally found, so you can often get them at the feed store on chick days. If you're going that route, my suggestion is to find out when the chick days are and call the feed store and ask what types of chickens they think they're going to be receiving and what day are they receiving them. Oftentimes the breeds go quickly and so you want to find, if they can't hold chicks for you, you want to go in on that day or those first couple of days to make sure that you get the chicks that you want. And the feed store gets their chickens from hatcheries too. Craigslist and the like are still an option here for baby chicks, but like I said, just check it out before you agree to buy any. When you go to the feed store to pick out your baby chicks, or if you're ordering them online, you're going to see something that either says straight run or pullets, or it will have it listed as female and male. Straight run means they're not sexed, so you don't know how many roosters you're going to end up with, and you don't know how many hens you're gonna end up with. We did straight run for our first flock, and we ended up with only three roosters. And honestly, that's pretty impressive. But my friend recently got some new chickens, and they ended up with five roosters out of six. And that's just not going to work. You only want one rooster per like every 12 hens if you decide that you want roosters. So my suggestion is to specifically get the females if you're not looking to have a full flock with roosters. But when you go to the feed store, you're going to need to determine, do I want to pull out of this straight run tub or should I go ahead and pick the females out? Once you've picked up your chicks, it's time to take them home to their nice, warm brooder box. Nice and warm. Chickens need heat. You need a safe and controlled space for them with ventilation and of course some sort of heat source that they're going to need for the first five to six weeks of their lives. So this brooder box behind me is great for the 20 chicks that we have in there. When they get up to six weeks they're going to be pretty cramped and it's definitely going to be time to move them into their permanent coop. You probably saw that on a previous video where I waited a little too long to move those juvenile birds into the coop. So you don't need something this big. You could use a stock tank, big or small. I've seen it in kiddie pools. You can definitely use a cardboard box, but they're harder to clean. We like metal and plastic tubs uh, because they're easier to clean out and then they can be used again later when you decide you want to grow your flock. And you probably will. Just remember that your birds are gonna need to stay there for the first six weeks of their lives until they're feathered out and have more control of their body temperature. Make sure that they have some room to grow there before you move them out. Which leads me to the question to ask, how many chickens did you bring home? A chicken is gonna lay an egg almost every day, but not every day. So for Eric, two chickens for us would not be enough for just eggs for us because we eat eggs every day. A perfect number of eggs for us would probably be four or five chickens. Just remember what I said about how many eggs a chicken produces a year and realize that in the winter months when the days are shorter, they'll be producing less. So you can keep your brooder box in a lot of different places. Obviously we're very blessed because we have a barn that we keep our brooder box. You could keep this in your home. You could keep this outside if it's completely protected. Um, but you know, you gotta kind of think about what makes sense for you and your family. Some people do have them inside to start for like the first couple of weeks and then they move the brooder box outside after a few weeks. That's completely up to you, but that heat source has to be available at all times. And the most important thing that you're gonna be providing to your chicks, other than food and water, is heat. And when your babies come home, that first week of life, they need it to be 95 degrees. You can buy an electric brooder light that the chickens kind of can stand under. Um, and those are really neat, and we can't wait to have those at Little Z Farm, but they've always just been a little bit out of our price range. And so we've always gone with the hanging heat lamps, and that's basically just this fixture that has the heat light in it. And I highly suggest getting the shatterproof lights. That might just be how they make them now, but always good to check the box to make sure. You can pick the lights up at the feed store, and I recommend having them on the day before you go to pick up your chicks, so that when you bring the chicks home, that space is nice and toasty. As your chicks grow older, you're gonna be able to raise that light little by little to make the, to decrease the temperature right directly under it. So it starts at 95 degrees, the next week the chickens are comfortable at 90, 85, at three weeks, and so on. 
We've never measured the temperature, we've always just monitored our chicks. They'll let you know if the space is too warm because they'll congregate outside the light. You have your heat source, whatever way you've decided to go. You also need dry bedding for them, and we've always used pine shavings for this. Um, right now, we have this really fine pine shavings because we got them on deep discount. Like 75% off, I love a good discount. But really, we just recommend the regular size pine shavings. It's gonna keep it clean, it's gonna, you know, some, sometimes the smaller pine shavings kind of compound, um, and it's not great. <laughs> but get the pine shavings at your local feed store too, or order them online. Um, it's gonna be about $6 for a big pack of pine shavings. And if you try to go to Walmart or Target or pet stores, um, that's gonna be a lot, the price is gonna be a lot heftier. Your chickens will start to make a mess as they get a little bit older. They'll knock water out, they'll knock shavings into their water. Um, it'll start to get a little moist in there from the droppings. You're gonna wanna add pine shavings almost every day to the top of this. So they have a nice dry space to be. You're also welcome to remove the pine shavings completely every day and put new pine shavings in, but we don't do that. We're gonna use what we've been piling on to add to our compost and it's gonna be already started, which is awesome for us. This method is called deep littering and I'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about the grown hens. So keep it dry, keep it warm, and then, you know, feed them and water them. Chicks need access to clean water at all times. And like I said before, chicks are known for scratching kind of droppings and their litter into their waters. We like to create a flat space that we can put the water on top of the shavings. So either plastic or wood that the waterer can kind of sit on. And it doesn't completely eliminate the problem of them gunking it up, but it certainly makes it better. You can get plastic, or metal waterers and feeders. These waterers have worked great for us. Um, and then these are the plastic feeders that I prefer. When we start out, we have the feeders open and we pour the food in and we have it open because we're letting them discover their food. And once that's happened, we use the lid so they can just dip their little heads in to get the food out of the holes. We do this because chickens have a desire to roost. So when you have things in there, they're going to climb on them. Um, and so if they're climbing on their feed when it's open, that means they're gonna be pooping in their own feed. And we don't like that. But when you go to feed them, dump out whatever they've added on accident to their feed bowl and start fresh each time that you feed them. Start your babies on starter feed. And this means that it has at least 18% protein. They need a lot of protein as they're starting to grow. You can buy this at your local feed store or farm store, or you can order it online. There are organic versions of this, but what you also need to make sure is that it's crumble. Um, you'll see crumble in pellets, and you shouldn't see starter feed that is in pellet form, but if you do, avoid it. Um, chicks need crumble, and as they get older, you'll probably want to switch to pellets because the pellets are less messy, um, but for right now, you gotta stick to the crumble starter feed. We feed our babies twice a day, and that's because we want them to get used to us being around, not necessarily because we need to feed them twice a day. Each chick will eat about an ounce of food each day, and so it ends up being about, ends up being a little bit over two and a half pounds of food per chick for the first six weeks. We tend to end up feeding a little bit more than that, and we kind of let the birds tell us as we go. I don't think you need to worry about overfeeding your chicks. You don't need to measure it out ounce for ounce. Most chicks naturally figure out where their water and food is once you bring them home. But if your box is a little bit bigger or you feel like they're not figuring it out, after a few hours of acclimating, pick them up one by one and gently dip their beaks in the water and gently dip their beaks in the food. If you're keeping your baby chicks in a garage or in the house or somewhere where there's not access to natural light, I recommend turning the light on during the day. You want your babies to get used to morning and night and the natural kind of movement of the day. The last thing I want to kind of talk about when it comes to baby chicks is you. The more time you spend with them, the more likely they're going to be used to you as they get older. Hold them, feed them from your hand, give them little finger taps on their little tiny heads. They're gonna become acclimated to you and they're gonna to begin to associate you with good things. And if you want a friendly chicken, you wanna do that. It's gonna make a world of difference when they break out of that brooder box for the brave new world they're about to encounter. Baby chicks are a ton of fun. 
And there are a million different things I could kind of outline in this, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview so you know all the different things that you need to get started. If you have any questions, please comment and ask below and I'll do my best to answer all of them. You're so close to having these laying hens and you're gonna love that the fruits of your efforts end up coming out into these beautiful, fresh eggs. In the next part of the series, we're gonna be talking about infrastructure, chicken infrastructure. We talked a little bit about the brooder boxes today and what your chicks need to be healthy and happy, but I wanna spend time in the next part of this series talking about the run, the coop, kind of the permanent infrastructure that you're gonna have on your property to house your grown hens. And this is important. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the next part of this series. Make sure that you subscribe below so you don't miss out on that and all the latest happenings at Little Z Farm. I can't wait to interact with you all more. Thanks for watching and see you next time here at Little Z Farm. Thank you.